Home across the state of Mahastra, Mahastra, that <laughs> nurtured and rehabilitated abandoned and orphaned children. During this time, she was heavily involved in the organization's Roots program, where people who were adopted children would return to India in search of their origins. This ignited her interest in theories and concepts of her identity. She is currently work working on a project, research project assessing the pathways to an ethnic and religious identity for the offspring of mismarriage, and specifically between a Par Parsi Zoroastrian parent and a non-Parsi non-Zoroastrian parent. And she said that if you want to help her on her project, you're gonna get in touch with her and contact her. And having lived in five countries and visited many more, she considers herself a world citizen. As a Parsi, she has a soft spot for a joyful evening spent in the company of family, friends, pets, music, and food, and wine. She enjoys a variety of things during her leisure time, including vintage clothes shopping, supporting Tottenham Hotspur FC, parking lot, partaking in London's cultural sense, and running along the canal near her flat in London. Please help me introduce Nazi Enchi. gentlemen, thank you for being here today. My name is Nasi Nanjunia and I'm going to be talking to you about conversion amongst the Parsi Sarastran community in Bombay in the 19th century in relation to one specific event, the Mazgar Novjot of 1882. The Mazgar Novjot refers to the initiation ceremonies of nine illegitimate children of Parsi fathers and non-Parsi mothers. The Novjotis, as I will refer to them, were of varying ages, seven being the youngest, 35 being the oldest. They lived opposite to and worked in the docks of Mazgao in Bombay. This subject formed the core of my doctoral thesis, chosen partly because of two significant priestly texts in old Gujarati, which had never been translated into English before, but also because this event was to have a lasting impact or effect on Parsi identity formation through to the present day. Few of you here today would have heard of the Mazgao Nojots, that occurred over a century ago, though you are no doubt aware of the significant Petit vs. Gigi Boy case of 1908, or as it came to be known, the Parsi Panchayat case. What I hope to achieve today is to introduce you to the forerunner of that case and its ramifications for perceptions of conversion within the Parsi community thereafter. I will begin by briefly outlining the circumstances surrounding conversion and how it has come to be understood by Parsis in India. I will then discuss the concept of conversion from a generic point of view, identifying three ways in which it can be applied to the Mazgaon Abjot case. The term Parsi, as it was understood by the Parsis themselves in the 19th century, refers to the descendants of Zoroastrian Iranians professing the Zoroastrian faith who fled persecution in Iran approximately the 10th century and sought refuge in India. Living and growing as a community in the subcontinent, by the 19th century, the Parsis had, under the British Raj, developed into an educated and prosperous community. They practiced endogamy, marrying within the Parsis Rastrum community, discouraging proselytization, and the seeking of converts into the religion. Therefore, the Parsi model of conversion is not a conventional one, and this presentation is not focused on the act or motive behind conversion, but rather how a community regards the idea of conversion and the converts themselves as personifications of that idea, in a bid to better understand and define their own religious identity. However, before discuss, discussing this in great detail, let's assess the basic definition of conversion. Conversion can be studied in numerous ways, and although Western scholars view psychology as a natural and default way to study conversion, it isn't the only way. Another popular methodology in dealing with the subject is the ethnographic study of a group of converts. This type of study determines the group structure, ascertains the motivations, and, anal and, and analyzes the processes behind the decision to convert and the achievement of conversion. A great amount of research has already been done on to create a formula or devise a step-by-step -step model of events that culminate in the co conversion process. However, these do not always work as conversion patterns vary from group to group, person to person, and the reasons for conversion can be positive like a deep desire for personal growth, or negative, 
like co coercive persuasion, where the whole process of conversion is seen as a devious activity. Conversion is an interdisciplinary subject. Anthropologists see it as a ritually marked adoption of a new religious belonging. Sociologists view it as a change in one's universe of discourse, with the latter seen not only as a change in values, beliefs, and identities, but more fundamentally and significantly, it entails the displacement of one's universe of discourse by another. Daniel Herveleger, a sociologist, proposes that there are three types of conversion. The first type, from unbelief to religious belief and belonging. The second type, from one religious affiliation to another. And the third type, from nominal to greater affiliation or reconversion, but within the same denomination. All three types are applicable to the Moscow objects of 1882. It only depends on how one perceives the situation, and in this instance, how members of the Parsi community define their own identity. To explain this crucial point more clearly, it is necessary to take a step back to 1839, when a Scottish missionary, uh, Reverend John Wilson, converted to Christianity two Parsi boys aged 16 and 18. Whilst traditional missionaries prefer evangelism as means of conversion, English and Western-style education was seen by Wilson as a means to further his missionary pursuits. He started an English school in 1832 with a student population of 45 Hindu and three Parsi boys. The school was transferred in 1835 to the Church of Scotland and renamed generally General Assembly's Institution with public notice given that the school would, alongside secular education, also provide schooling on Christian doctrines and tenets. In 1837, the pupil population had risen to 230. Wilson was learned in the various religious religions of India, including Hinduism, Islam, and rationalism, and languages, including Marathi, Gujarati, Hindi, and Persian, and would often engage the various communities in highly polemic discussions. When news broke about the conversions, the Parsi community was shocked and angered that one of their own had left the faith. In his memoirs, Ganji Bhai Nauruji, one of those young, con young converts who later became an ordained priest and missionary in India, wrote that the conversion was condemned as an attack on the Zoroastrian religion and the whole Parsi community. The community did not view Tanjibai's decision as a private and personal one, and instead concerned themselves with the perceived negative impact of showing a weakness in the community's ability to maintain control over one of its own. In his memoirs, he said, I quote, the newspapers gave warning that Tanji today was about to leave the religion of his fathers and enter that of strangers. They violently denounced the baptism, and the Parsis moved heaven and earth to prevent it. End quote. By taking a firm stand against the conversion, the community sent a strong message of intolerance to dissuade anyone from following in Banji Fai's footsteps. More importantly, it demonstrated that the Parsi identity at the time confined the Zoroastrian religion to the ethnic Parsi community, meaning that if one converted out of the religion, then one was no longer a Parsi. Case in point, Banjibai Naroji, who was excommunicated from the Parsi community because both the religion and the ethnicity were bound as one, and he was, as he was no longer a Zoroastrian, he could no longer be a Parsi and be part of the socio-cultural aspects of the community. As the community practiced endogamy and denied proselytization, one could neither be Zoroastrian without being Parsi, nor Parsi without being Zoroastrian, as Banjibai's conversion demonstrates. While the instances of conversion out of the religion were rare, what seemed to be an ongoing issue within the community over the 18th and 19th centuries, possibly even longer, were illegitimate children of Parsi fathers and non-Parsi mothers. The Parsi fathers were conducting the nubjots of their, of their children, and over time this became an issue as it became more widespread within the community. As the Parsi community viewed Parsi and being Zoroastrian as one, the community elders who had a strong grip over the community at the time attempted to deal with this issue by questioning the legitimacy of such children in the Parsi community. They declared in 1818 that to be Parsi, one had to be born of two Parsi parents. The children born of Parsi fathers and non-Parsi mothers were considered to be non-Parsi by the Bombay Parsi Panchayat, the authoritative body of the Parsi community. Ergo, their nuptial ceremonies were classified as conversions rather than as an initiation into the religion of their fathers, and thus illegal. However, the issue persisted, as nubjot ceremonies were conducted in clandestine and secret, 
well past the middle of the century. In 1865, the Parsi community had the opportunity to set for themselves a legally binding definition of identity. Progressive in nature, the Parsi laws were a set of laws that were community-specific to the Parsis in British India and were a consequence of the changes occurring in the community economically, educationally, and philosophically. Hence, they were the cornerstone of Parsi identity at the time and reflected the views held by the community at large on matters such as intestate inheritance and succession and marriage and divorce. The Parsi laws restricted its jurisdiction to marriage between a Parsi man and a Parsi woman. Irresponsibly, what was not included was a legislative definition of the term Parsi that was acceptable within the community. The laws did not account for marriages taking place between a Parsi and a non-Parsi as there were no such cases of marriages taking place in the first place. However, the existence of illegitimate children of Parsi fathers and non-Parsi mothers continued to be an issue and the Parsi law laws provided no legal recourse for such children either in the Marriage and Divorce Act or in the Parsi Intestate Succession Act. This oversight by the Parsi Association would have lasting ramifications for the fate of such children and the development of the Parsi identity. One example of how the Parsi community can perceived and dealt with the illegitimate children of Parsi fathers and non-Parsi mothers is displayed in the build-up and aftermath of the Mazgaon Nabjots of 1882. When the Mazgaon Nabjots took place on the 26th of June, 1882, they caused a great excitement and discussion within the Parsi community. A local newspaper, the Mumbai Samachar, reported the next day that as a result of this incident, I quote, there is much partisanship within the Parsi community, so too is their hatred. This sums up quite neatly the intense polemic nature of the Navjots. The lead up to the Navjots spanned approximately 10 years, and I will briefly discuss this next. Of relatively poor financial means, the Mazgaon Navjotis did not have the funds to pay for their own Navjots, and hence were not initiated into the Zoroastrian religion. In approximately 1872, a discussion began about the circumstances of these people within the Parsi community, but before anything was done, the discussion ended. It was revived three years later in 1875 when a prominent member of the Parsi community, Dosabai Bod, decided to promote this discussion. He found out as much as he could about these people and satisfied himself that they were of the Parsi seed or, uh, or that their fathers were Parsi. This is an important consideration because the Parsi community is historically patrilineal, but it highlights the shift from the earlier two Parsi parent rule um, enforced by the Panchayat. Now it seemed that the children of Parsi fathers had a birthright to practice the Zoroastrian religion, as both concluded that they were like Parsis in every way, in their beliefs and ritual observances, day-to-day -day practices, and dress, and he felt no hesitation in informing other prominent gentlemen and priests of the community that these people who wanted to should have their nuptial ceremonies performed. As a result of Dosabai Bod's campaign, it was resolved that these impoverished Mazgaon Nabjotis would have their nuptial ceremonies conducted. And another wealthy and prominent gentleman of the Pasi community at the time, Mirvanji Pandey, offered to take on the entire expense for all nine Nabjotis. However, these plans were soon derailed and ultimately amounted to naught as none of the Navjotis wanted, wanted to be the first to be initiated into the religion. It was later found out that threats of violence had been made against them. They were told that they would be beaten, their sadres ripped from their bodies, and be rejected by the whole community if they went ahead with the Navjots. Some five to six years later, the father of one of the Navjotis was on his deathbed and appealed to his children to have their Navjots performed at any cost. And so the discussion was revisited. They sent a letter to Naroji Wadia and Nana Bai Banaji, two eminent leaders of the Zrashtra community, explaining to them of their renewed and resolute desire to be initiated into the Zrashtra religion. When a letter declaring the desire of these Naujikis was printed in the Jame Jamshed, a renowned newspaper, it led to fervent debate. This time around, it was members of the community, approximately 200 of them, who set up and filled a fund to finance the Navjot ceremonies. Such was the support that Parsi gentlemen commented in a letter to the organizer of the Navjots that, I quote, In Moscow there are children of our Zatoshti men, 
and as soon as they show a desire to wear the Sudre Kasti according to the rites of our religion, then give them a non, which is a ritual purification bath, and make them wear the Sudre Kasti in our fire temple." End quote. The above quote demonstrates that the practice of performing nabjots on children of Parsi fathers and non-Parsi mothers was increasingly common and accepted in Bombay as he was condoning the practice by accepting the ceremonies take place and the Navjotis be allowed, nay, welcomed into the fire temple. The Mazda Navjotis were taken into the Zoroastrian ceremony in a uh, Zoroastrian religion in a ceremony performed by nine leading priests, including the head priests of the Parsi Zoroastrian community, Jasu <coughs> Jamasji Mino Cherji Jabaspasana, and the Pantuki of the Kapawala Agyari, Dasu Kukudaru in front of many witnesses who were there to be part of a momentous event. However, this occasion was not without its controversies. Outside the venue, the prominent head priest of the Vadyoji Atashvaram and <coughs> nemesis of Dasruji Jamas Vasana handed out flyers accusing the priests, financiers, and supporters of the ceremony of wrongdoing by claiming that the new reg religionists were Juddins or non-Parsis. The flyer stated, I quote, Today at the Manikji Navruji Seth Garden in Moscow, those that have made the Juddins wear the Sudre have not made it clear the way the ceremony had taken place. Until the details of the ceremony were made clear in a suitable way, my confidence will not come. And I, along with the oneness <coughs> of in thought with the trustees, request those who wear such Sudres to stay far away from the Hormasji Bairamji Wadeji Atish Bairam, end quote. A negative reaction is perfectly understandable, as many at the time felt that even with Parsi fathers, these new religionists were not Parsi, and hence unable to be Zoroastrians by birth or Navjot. Nonetheless, Dastur Jamaspasana's response is curious, sorry, Dastur Sanjana's response is curious. He questioned the manner in which the ceremonies had taken place, and for the new religionists to stay far away until he and the trustees of the board of the fire temple were satisfied that the ceremonies had been conducted properly before allowing the new initiates into his fire temple. Also, he calls them Juddin, a term denoting someone who is non-Parsi, but instead of denying them the right to enter the religion altogether, as one would expect, he is concerned by the way the ceremonies initiating them into the religion have been performed. By calling the Mazgaon Navjotis Juddins, I suggest he was simply attempting to, attempting to antagonize the Navjot organizers because as controversial as the Navjot ceremonies were, they would have been virtually impossible had the perspective initiates in fact have been Juddin or non-Parsi. Also, he would have had to print the flyers before the ceremony and bring them with him if he was to hand it out after the ceremony had taken place, further highlighting his bias. Furthermore, he had been invited by Naruji Wadia, one of the organizers of the event, to be one of the priests to perform the Navjot. On the 21st of June, 1882, Wadia sent Dasu Sanjana a letter informing him of the Navjot soon to take place and requesting him to, I quote, with his own pure hands, make them wear the Sudre Kasti, end quote. Dasu Sanjana turned down the offer, stating that while Wadiaji was doing good work, he could not participate in the ceremony, I quote, in our religion, there is a law that any Juddin with his own true faith wanting to join the religion should definitely be allowed to be taken in. If he is not taken in, taken in to the religion, then that religion makes little sense. And if any religion in the world makes little sense, then it is not a religion at all. But, but the time is bad. We cannot place this rule over our community. That is why we should first get the acceptance of our panchayat trustees and then do the work. End quote. In previous years, the Panchayat trustees had played an imposing role in the religious, social, and cultural affairs of the community. But after 1875, had taken on an administrative role in the trust funds and properties held by the community and had distanced themselves from religious matters. Dastro Sanjana himself was unable to galvanize support from the Panchayat trustees against the Navjot ceremony. And so approximately a couple of months after the Navjots, he produced a booklet in which he asserted that, I quote, Juddins should be allowed to enter the religion as it is said in our scriptures. If a Juddin and his family with their own desire want to enter, then all the rituals should be done to allow him and his family into our religion, end quote. And I quote, 
Taking a judgun into the religion is an act of goodwill and will help reduce your sins. End quote. Although it may seem from these two above quotations that Dasur Sanjana was expounding the conversion of non Parsis, it is worth remembering that he refers to the Mazgan Naujotis as Judins, and so it is unclear whether he is referring to the children of Parsi fathers or non Parsis altogether. However, further in his booklet, he derided the Mazgan Naujoti organizers and accused the priests of performing the Naujot ceremonies incorrectly. In response to the accusations laid down by Dasru Sanjana, to preserve the reputation and validity of the involved priests and to set the record straight, the head priest of the Parsi Anjuman and the lead priest in the Mazgaon Navjot, Dasru Jamas Pasana, produced a counter booklet in 1883 in which he refuted the allegations and accusations of Dasru Sanjana. These two Gujarati books are amongst the most important pieces of evidence for the views held in the 19th century Parsi community literature on the topic of conversion and inter-community relations. Unfortunately, Dasru Sanjana's booklet is missing, but it was heavily quoted in Dasru Jamas Pasana's booklet, which I was fortunate enough to find and translate. First and foremost, the Dasru, Dasru Sanjana's booklet informed the public on why the Mazgaon Abjotis could not be considered Jiddins. After all, they were the children of Parsi fathers, and he refutes all the accusations made <clears throat> regarding the nuptial ceremonies. However, Dasru Jamas Pasana went one step further and discussed in great detail what he believed were the correct ceremonies needed to initiate a true Judin or a true non Parsi into the religion. He drew on a wide range of Avastan and Pali religious scriptures and Persian poetry and texts in making a case for the duty of every Zoroastrian to aid in the process of education and conversion of non Zoroastrians. He does add a disclaimer stating that perhaps his views are a bit ahead of their time. After the Navjot, after the, Navjot the Parsis were in a grip of excitement and were, at least at the face of, his, face, face of it, encouraging a paradigm shift within the community. At the end of an article briefly detailing the Navjots, the Rask of Tar, a political newspaper started by Dadabai Nauroji, puts a question to the community. I quote, there is no known obstacle from the religion to take full Judins into the Zartushti community. Then what could be the problem in taking in the into the religion those born of Zartushti fathers? End quote. And so, did the monumental paradigm shift occur? Alas, no. In the long term, the Mazban Navjots played a pivotal role in solidifying the patrilineal identity of the community. By the early 20th century, all the old discussions about conversion had been forgotten, and questions were once again, once again resurfaced in the years of debate following the marriage in 1903 of Ratanji Dadabai Tata to a French lady, Suzanne Bruyère. Before the marriage, Tata had asked the then high, high priest of the Anjuman, Arthur Shperam, Dastroji Kekushru, Jamas Ji Jamas Pasana, and for those of you paying attention, he is the son of Dasruji Jamasji Jamas Pasana, who performed the Mazgan Navjots. To perform his fiancée's Navjot ceremony, he obliged and Suzanne Breer was invested with the Sudre Christi, after which the couple were married in a traditional Zoroastrian ceremony. Her name after marriage was Sunitata. However, her acceptance in the commun into community religious life was challenged as she was denied entry into Zoroastrian places of worship and the right to access Panchayat trust funds and properties. Pitit versus Jijiboy in 1908, or as it came to be known, the Parsi Panchayat case of 1908, marks the watershed in the emotionally charged debate of conversion and intermarriage. Seven members of the community took five trustees of the Panchayat to court in 1906 to contest that a non-Parsi can convert into Zoroastrianism and henceforth enjoy all the rights and privileges afforded to a person who was Parsi by birth. The Panchayat case case raised several religious and social issues, including whether the Zoroastrian religion prescribed <coughs> conversion, and if it did, who could convert, and could the convert have access to the BPP trust funds and properties. It was judged in due course that although Zoroastrianism enjoyed conversion legally, only members of the Parsi community could be entitled to the use and benefit of the BPP trust funds and properties, which included the Dungarwadi, Dhamma and um, a few uh, fire temples in India. 
Um, as the founders of those trust funds and properties would have only ever intended for Parsi Zoroastrians and not non-Parsi Zoroastrians to make use of them. Consequently, in his detailed judgments, one of the two presiding judges, Justice Dagger, himself a Parsi, took a stand and expounded that expounded who could be considered a member of the Parsi community. This judgment is monumental because never before had it been so plainly stated. He concluded that the Parsi community consisted of, one, Parsis who were descended from the original Persian immigrants and who were born of Zoroastrian parents and who professed the Zoroastrian religion. Iranians from Persia professing the Zoroastrian religion who came to India either temporarily or permanently, and three, the children of Parsi fathers by alien mothers who have been duly and properly admitted into the religion. The last definition, the third one, was a direct result of the Mazgar Navjots. The presence of documented proof that the practice had been accepted in the past provided usage practice in a country determined to hold on to and maintain past traditions. Adversely, the children of Parsi women and non-Parsi men could not be included in the definition because no one during the course of the trial could produce irrefutable evidence that the practice was ongoing or had occurred in the past and been accepted by the community. Thus, to sum up, why did the Masgav Navjot case cause such a stir within the Parsi community and how have they continued to impact us today? Firstly, while the practice of initiating the, initiating the illegitimate children of Parsi men and non-Parsi women into the Zoroastrian religion had been ongoing throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, it had never taken place in such a public manner. Most previous initiations would have taken place in clandestine ceremonies away from the glare of the community at large. The large group of initiates, nine of them, who had made impassioned pleas for help, directly reaching out to the Parsi public, raised awareness and the subsequent re reactions to the Navjots. Secondly, the open debate between two high priests of the community added weight to the significance of the event. The publication of booklets months and even a year after the event kept it fresh in the minds of the Parsi community. The lack of a consensus, consensus, cons, sorry, consensus on group identity caused a theological debate unlike any before and required the Parsi community to question their deep-seated beliefs and be directly faced with a situation they were unfamiliar with or try to keep out of the public domain. The Mazda Narjots showcased the discourse surrounding the sensitive subject was based on people's perceptives. perspectives. Thus, we see how all three of Daniel Hevelege's types of conversion are applicable to the debate at hand. Thus, if a person perceives that a child of mixed Parsi, Zoroastrian, and non-Parsi, non-Zoroastrian heritage cannot be considered Parsi, then conversion by way of the Namjot ceremony is happening from outside the Parsi Zoroastrian community. Therefore, the person of mixed heritage could be perceived to convert into Zoroastrianism from a state of unbelief to a state of belief and belonging. Secondly, they could be perceived to convert from one religious affiliation to another religious affiliation by pre-associating the child with the religion of their non-Zoroastrian parent, traditionally the mother. And third, if it is perceived that the children of mixed heritage can be considered Parsis, then conversion by undergoing the Najo ceremony is from a nominal or lesser affiliation into a greater reaffiliation or a reconversion within the religion. Today, the community continues to grapple with conversion into marriage and acceptance of children of those mixed marriages. The enactment of the Special Marriages Act in 1954 meant that a woman who married out of the religion did not have to convert to the religion of her husband and could continue practicing her own religion. This caused a breach between the laws of the land and the traditional practice of the Parsi Zoroastrian community. For many years, Parsi Zoroastrian women who have married out faced multiple restrictions. They were excluded from fire temples, banned from funerary sites and rituals, and were not allowed to initiate their children into the Zoroastrian faith. In India today, there are two cases one in the Supreme Court and one in the Calcutta High Court, which have the potential to drastically change the landscape in which the Zoroastrian religion is practiced in India. Parsi Zoroastrian women who have married non-Parsi non-Zoroastrian men and have been denied access to fire temples and funerary sites and having the Najot 
ceremony of their children recognized, have taken their respective associations to court to fight for their and their children's rights to practice their faith. Once again, over a century later, it is the Indian judicial system which will define the Parsi Sarastran identity. Home across the state of Mahasastra, Mahasastra, that <laughs> nurtured and rehabilitated abandoned and orphaned children. During this time, she was heavily involved in the organization's Roots program, where people who were adopted children would return to India in search of their origins. This ignited her interest in theories and concepts of her identity. She is currently work, working on a project, research project assessing the pathways to an ethnic and religious identity for the offspring of mismarriage, and specifically between a Par Parsi Zoroastrian parent and a non-Parsi non-Zoroastrian parent. And she said that if you want to help her on her project, or get in touch with her and contact her. And having lived in five countries and visited many more, she considers herself a world citizen. As a Parsi, she has a soft spot for a joyful evening spent in the company of family, friends, pets, music, and food, and wine. She enjoys a variety of things during her leisure time, including vintage clothes, shopping, supporting Tottenham, Hotspur, FC, parking lot, partaking in London's cultural sense, and running along the canal near her flat in London. Please help me introduce Nazi and Chini. gentlemen, thank you for being here today. My name is Nasi Nanjunia and I'm going to be talking to you about conversion amongst the Pasi Sarastran community in Bombay in the 19th century in relation to one specific event, the Mazgaon Novjot of 1882. The Mazgaon Novjot refers to the initiation ceremonies of nine illegitimate children of Pasi fathers and non-Pasi mothers. The Novjotis, as I will refer to them, were of varying ages, seven being the youngest, 35 being the oldest. They lived opposite to and worked in the docks of Mazgao in Bombay. This subject formed the core of my doctoral thesis, chosen partly because of two significant priestly texts in old Gujarati, which had never been translated into English before, but also because this event was to have a lasting impact or effect on Parsi identity formation through to the present day. Few of you here today would have heard of the Mazgao Nabjots, that occurred over a century ago, though you are no doubt aware of the significant Petit vs. Gigi Boy case of 1908, or as it came to be known, the Parsi Panchayat case. What I hope to achieve today is to introduce you to the forerunner of that case and its ramifications for perceptions of conversion within the Parsi community thereafter. I will begin by briefly outlining the circumstances surrounding conversion and how it has come to be understood by Parsis in India. I will then discuss the concept of conversion from a generic point of view, identifying three ways in which it can be applied to the Moscow Nabjot case. The term Parsi, as it was understood by the Parsis themselves in the 19th century, refers to the descendants of Zoroastrian Iranians professing the Zoroastrian faith who fled persecution in Iran approximately the 10th century and sought refuge in India. Living and growing as a community in the subcontinent, by the 19th century, the Parsis had, under the British Raj, developed into an educated and prosperous community. They practiced endogamy, marrying within the Parsis Rastrum community, discouraging proselytization, and the seeking of converts into the religion. Therefore, the Parsi model of conversion is not a conventional one, and this presentation is not focused on the act or motive behind conversion, but rather how a community regards the idea of conversion and the converts themselves as personifications of that idea, in a bid to better understand and define their own religious identity. However, before discuss, discussing this in greater detail, let's assess the basic definition of conversion. Conversion can be studied in numerous ways, and although Western scholars view psychology as a natural and default way to study conversion, it isn't the only way. Another popular methodology in dealing with the subject is the ethnographic study of a group of converts, this type of study determines the group structure, ascertains the motivations, and, anal and, and analyzes the processes behind the decision to convert and the achievement of conversion. A great amount of research has already been done on to create a formula or devise a step-by-step -step model of events that culminate in the co conversion process. However, these do not always work as conversion patterns vary from group to group, person to person, 
and the reasons for conversion can be positive, like a deep desire for personal growth, or negative, like co coercive persuasion, where the whole process of conversion is seen as a devious activity. Conversion is an interdisciplinary subject. Anthropologists see it as a ritually marked adoption of a new religious belonging. Sociologists view it as a change in one's universe of discourse, with the latter seen not only as a change in values, beliefs, and identities, but more fundamentally and significantly, it entails the displacement of one's universe of discourse by another. Daniel Herberleger, a sociologist, proposes that there are three types of conversion. The first type, from unbelief to religious belief and belonging. The second type, from one religious affiliation to another. And the third type, from nominal to greater affiliation or reconversion, but within the same denomination. All three types are applicable to the Mazda objects of 1882. It only depends on how one perceives the situation. And in this instance, how members of the Parsi community define their own identity. To explain this crucial point more clearly, it is necessary to take a step back to 1839, when a Scottish missionary, uh, Reverend John Wilson, converted to Christianity two Parsi boys aged 16 and 18. Whilst traditional missionaries prefer evangelism as means of conversion, English and Western-style education was seen by Wilson as a means to further his missionary pursuits. He started an English school in 1832, with a student population of 45 Hindu and three Parsi boys. The school was transferred in 1835 to the Church of Scotland and renamed generally General Assembly's Institution, with public notice given that the school would, alongside secular education, also provide schooling on Christian doctrines and tenets. In 1837, the pupil population had risen to 230. Wilson was learned in the various religious religions of India, including Hinduism, Islam, and rationalism, and languages, including Marathi, Gujarati, Hindi, and Persian, and would often engage the various communities in highly polemic discussions. When news broke about the conversions, the Parsi community was shocked and angered that one of their own had left the faith. In his memoirs, Ganji Bhai Nawaji, one of those young, con young converts, who later became an ordained priest and missionary in India, wrote that the conversion was condemned as an attack on the Zoroastrian religion and the whole Parsi community. The community did not view Tanjibai's decision as a private and personal one, and instead concerned themselves with the perceived negative impact of showing a weakness in the community's ability to maintain control over one of its own. In his memoirs, he said, I quote, the newspapers gave warning that Tanji today was about to leave the religion of his fathers and enter that of strangers. They violently denounced the baptism, and the Parsis moved heaven and earth to prevent it. End quote. By taking a firm stand against the conversion, the community sent a strong message of intolerance to dissuade anyone from following in Banji Pai's footsteps. More importantly, it demonstrated that the Parsi identity at the time confined the Zoroastrian religion to the ethnic Parsi community, meaning that if one converted out of the religion, then one was no longer a Parsi. Case in point, Danjibai Naroji, who was excommunicated from the Parsi community because both the religion and the ethnicity were bound as one, and he was, as he was no longer a Zoroastrian, he could no longer be a Parsi and be part of the socio-cultural aspects of the community. As the community practiced endogamy and denied proselytization, one could neither be Zoroastrian without being Parsi, nor Parsi without being Zoroastrian, as Danjibai's conversion demonstrates. While the instances of conversion out of the religion were rare, what seemed to be an ongoing issue within the community over the 18th and 19th centuries, possibly even longer, were illegitimate children of Parsi fathers and non-Parsi mothers. The Parsi fathers were conducting the nubjots of their, of their children, and over time this became an issue as it became more widespread within the community. As the Parsi community viewed Parsi and being Zoroastrian as one, the community elders who had a strong grip over the community at the time attempted to deal with this issue by questioning the legitimacy of such children in the Parsi community. They declared in 1818 that to be Parsi, one had to be born of two Parsi parents. The children born of Parsi fathers and non-Parsi mothers were considered to be non-Parsi by the Bombay Parsi Panchayat, the authoritative body of the Parsi community. Ergo, their nuptial ceremonies were classified as conversions rather than as an initiation into the religion of their fathers, and thus illegal. 
However, the issue persisted as Nabdra ceremonies were conducted in clandestine and secret well past the middle of the century. In 1865, the Parsi community had the opportunity to set for themselves a legally binding definition of identity. Progressive in nature, the Parsi laws were a set of laws that were community-specific to the Parsis in British India and were a consequence of the changes occurring in the community economically, educationally, and philosophically. Hence, they were the cornerstone of Parsi identity at the time and reflected the views held by the community at large on matters such as intestate inheritance and succession and marriage and divorce. The Parsi laws restricted its jurisdiction to marriage between a Parsi man and a Parsi woman. Irresponsibly, what was not included was a legislative definition of the term Parsi that was acceptable within the community. The laws did not account for marriages taking place between a Parsi and a non-Parsi as there were no such cases of marriages taking place in the first place. However, the existence of illegitimate children of Parsi fathers and non-Parsi mothers continued to be an issue and the Parsi laws provided no legal recourse for such children either in the Marriage and Divorce Act or in the Parsi Intestate Succession Act. This oversight by the Parsi Association would have lasting ramifications for the fate of such children and the development of the Parsi identity. One example of how the Parsi community can perceived and dealt with the illegitimate children of Parsi fathers and non-Parsi mothers is displayed in the build-up and aftermath of the Mazgaon Nabjots of 1882. When the Mazgaon Nabjots took place on the 26th of June, 1882, they caused a great excitement and discussion within the Parsi community. A local newspaper, the Mumbai Samachar, reported the next day that as a result of this incident, I quote, there is much partisanship within the Parsi community, so too is their hatred. This sums up quite neatly the intense polemic nature of the Navjots. The lead up to the Navjots spanned approximately 10 years and I will briefly discuss this next. Of relatively poor financial means, the Mazdao Navjotis did not have the funds to pay for their own Navjots and hence were not initiated into the Zoroastrian religion. In approximately 1872, a discussion began about the circumstances of these people within the Parsi community, but before anything was done, the discussion ended. It was revived three years later in 1875 when a prominent member of the Parsi community, Dosabai Bod, decided to promote this discussion. He found out as much as he could about these people and satisfied himself that they were of the Parsi seed or, uh, or that their fathers were Parsi. This is an important consideration because the Parsi community is historically patrilineal, but it highlights the shift from the earlier two Parsi parent rule um, enforced by the Panchayat. Now it seemed that the children of Parsi fathers had a birthright to practice the Zoroastrian religion, as both concluded that they were like Parsis in every way, in their beliefs and ritual observances, day-to-day -day practices, and dress, and he felt no hesitation in informing other prominent gentlemen and priests of the community that these people who wanted to should have their nuptial ceremonies performed. As a result of Dosabai Bodh's campaign, it was resolved that these impoverished Mazgaon Nabjotis would have their nuptial ceremonies conducted. And another wealthy and prominent gentleman of the Pasi community at the time, Mirvanji Pandey, offered to take on the entire expense for all nine Nabjotis. However, these plans were soon derailed and ultimately amounted to naught, as none of the Navjotis wanted, wanted to be the first to be initiated into the religion. It was later found out that threats of violence had been made against them. They were told that they would be beaten, their sadres ripped from their bodies, and be rejected by the whole community if they went ahead with the Navjots. Some five to six years later, the father of one of the Navjotis was on his deathbed, and appealed to his children to have their nuptials performed at any cost. And so the discussion was revisited. They sent a letter to Naroji Wadia and Nana Bai Banaji, two eminent leaders of the Zrashtran community, explaining to them of their renewed and resolute desire to be initiated into the Zrashtran religion. When a letter declaring the desire of these nuptials was printed in the Jame Jamshed, a renowned newspaper, it led to fervent debate. This time around, it was members of the community, approximately 200 of them, who set up and filled a fund to finance the Nabjot ceremonies. Such was the support that Parsi gentlemen commented in a letter to the organizer of the Nabjots that, I quote, 
In Mazgaon, there are children of our Zatoshti men, and as soon as they show a desire to wear the Sudre Kasti according to the rites of our religion, then give them a non, which is a ritual purification bath, and make them wear the Sudre Kasti in our fire temple. End quote. The above quote demonstrates that the practice of performing nabjots on children of Parsi fathers and non Parsi mothers was increasingly common and accepted in Bombay as he was condoning the practice by accepting the ceremonies take place and the Navjotis be allowed, nay, welcomed, into the fire temple. The Mazda Navjotis were taken into the Zoroastrian ceremony in a Zoroastrian religion in a ceremony performed by nine leading priests, including the head priests of the Parsi Zoroastrian community, Jasru <coughs> Jamasji, Mino Cherji Jamaspasana, and the Pantuki of the Kapawala Agyari, Jasru Kukudaru in front of many witnesses who were there to be part of a momentous event. However, this occasion was not without its controversies. Outside the venue, the prominent head priest of the Vadyaji Atish Baram and <coughs> nemesis of Dasruji Jamas Pasana handed out flyers accusing the priests, financiers, and supporters of the ceremony of wrongdoing by claiming that the new religionists were Juddins or non-Parsis. The flyer stated, I quote, Today at the Manikji Navoji Seth Garden in Moscow, those that have made the Juddins wear the Sudre have not made it clear the way the ceremony had taken place. Until the details of the ceremony were made clear in a suitable way, my confidence will not come. And I, along with the oneness <coughs> of in thought with the trustees, request those who wear such Sudres to stay far away from the Hormasji Bairamji Wadeji Atish Bairam. End quote. A negative reaction is perfectly understandable, as many at the time felt that even with Parsi fathers, these new religionists were not Parsi, and hence unable to be Zoroastrians by birth or Navjot. Nonetheless, Dastru Jamas Pasana's response is curious, sorry, Dastru Sanjana's response is curious. He questioned the manner in which the ceremonies had taken place, and for the new religionists to stay far away until he and the trustees of the board of the fire temple was satisfied that the ceremonies had been conducted properly before allowing the new initiates into his fire temple. Also, he calls them Juddin, a term denoting someone who is non-Parsi, but instead of denying them the right to enter the religion altogether, as one would expect, he is concerned by the way the ceremonies initiating them into the religion have been performed. By calling the Mazda Navjotis Jutins, I suggest he was simply attempting to, attempting to antagonize the Navjot organizers because, as controversial as the Navjot ceremonies were, they would have been virtually impossible had the perspective initiates, in fact, have been Juddin or non Parsi. Also, he would have had to print the flyers before the ceremony and bring them with him if he was to hand it out after the ceremony had taken place, further highlighting his bias. Furthermore, he had been invited by Naraji Wadia, one of the organizers of the event, to be one of the priests to perform the Navjot. On the 21st of June, 1882, Wadia sent Dasru Sanjana a letter informing him of the Navjot soon to take place and requesting him to, I quote, with his own pure hands, make them wear the Sudre Kasti, end quote. Dasru Sanjana turned down the offer, stating that while Wadiaji was doing good work, he could not participate in the ceremony, I quote, in our religion, there is a law that any Juddin with his own true faith wanting to join the religion should definitely be allowed to be taken in. If he is not taken in, taken into the religion, then that religion makes little sense. And if any religion in the world makes little sense, then it is not a religion at all. But, but the time is bad. We cannot place this rule over our community. That is why we should first get the acceptance of our Panchaya trustees and then do the work. End quote. In previous years, the Panchayat trustees had played an imposing role in the religious, social, and cultural affairs of the community. But after 1875, had taken on an administrative role in the trust funds and properties held by the community and had distanced themselves from religious matters. Dastro Sanjana himself was unable to galvanize support from the Panchayat trustees against the Navjot ceremony. And so approximately a couple of months after the Navjots, he produced a booklet in which he asserted that, I quote, Judans should be allowed to enter the religion as it is said in our scriptures. If a Judan and his family with their own desire want to enter, then all the rituals should be done to allow him and his family into our religion, end quote. And I quote, 
Taking a judgun into the religion is an act of goodwill and will help reduce your sins. End quote. Although it may seem from these two above quotations that Dasur Sanjana was expounding the conversion of non Parsis, it is worth remembering that he refers to the Mazgan Naujotis as Judins, and so it is unclear whether he is referring to the children of Parsi fathers or non Parsis altogether. However, further in his booklet, he derided the Mazgan Naujoti organizers and accused the priests of performing the Naujot ceremonies incorrectly. In response to the accusations laid down by Dasru Sanjana, to preserve the reputation and validity of the involved priests and to set the record straight, the head priest of the Parsi Anjuman and the lead priest in the Mazgaon Navjot, Dasru Jamas Pasana, produced a counter booklet in 1883 in which he refuted the allegations and accusations of Dasru Sanjana. These two Gujarati books are amongst the most important pieces of evidence for the views held in the 19th century Parsi community literature on the topic of conversion and inter-community relations. Unfortunately, Dasru Sanjana's booklet is missing, but it was heavily quoted in Dasru Jamas Pasana's booklet, which I was fortunate enough to find and translate. First and foremost, the Dasru, Dasru Sanjana's booklet informed the public on why the Mazgaon Jyotis could not be considered Juddins. After all, they were the children of Parsi fathers, and he refutes all the accusations made <clears throat> regarding the Navjot ceremonies. However, Dasru Jamas Pasana went one step further and discussed in great detail what he believed were the correct ceremonies needed to initiate a true Juddin or a true non Parsi into the religion. He drew on a wide range of Avastan and Pali religious scriptures and Persian poetry and texts in making a case for the duty of every Zoroastrian to aid in the process of education and conversion of non Zoroastrians. He does add a disclaimer stating that perhaps his views are a bit ahead of their time. After the Navjot, after the, Navjot the Parsis were in a grip of excitement and were, at least at the face of, his, face, face of it, encouraging a paradigm shift within the community. At the end of an article briefly detailing the Navjots, the Rask of Tar, a political newspaper started by Dadabai Nauroji, puts a question to the community. I quote, there is no known obstacle from the religion to take full Judins into the Zartushti community. Then what could be the problem in taking in the into the religion those born of Zartushti fathers? End quote. And so, did the monumental paradigm shift occur? Alas, no. In the long term, the Mazba Navjots played a pivotal role in solidifying the patrilineal identity of the community. By the early 20th century, all the old discussions about conversion had been forgotten, and questions were once again, once again resurfaced in the years of debate following the marriage in 1903 of Ratanji Dadabai Tata to a French lady, Suzanne Bouguer. Before the marriage, Tata had asked the then high, high priest of the Anjuman, Atash Behram, Dasroji Kekushru, Jamas Ji Jamas Pasana, and for those of you paying attention, he is the son of Dasruji Jamas Ji Jamas Pasana, who performed the Mazgan Navjots. To perform his fiancée's Navjot ceremony, he obliged and Suzanne Greer was invested with the Sudre Christi, after which the couple were married in a traditional Zoroastrian ceremony. Her name after marriage was Sunitata. However, her acceptance in the commu into community religious life was challenged as she was denied entry into Zoroastrian places of worship and the right to access Panchayat trust funds and properties. Pitit versus Jijiboy in 1908, or as it came to be known, the Parsi Panchayat case of 1908, marks the watershed in the emotionally charged debate of conversion and intermarriage. Seven members of the community took five trustees of the Panchayat to court in 1906 to contest that a non-Parsi can convert into Zoroastrianism and henceforth enjoy all the rights and privileges afforded to a person who was Parsi by birth. The Panchayat case case raised several religious and social issues, including whether the Zoroastrian religion prescribed <coughs> conversion, and if it did, who could convert, and could the convert have access to the BPP trust funds and properties. It was judged in due course that although Zoroastrianism <coughs> enjoyed conversion legally, only members of the Parsi community could be entitled to the use and benefit of the BPP trust funds and properties, which included the Dungarvadi, Dhatma and um, a few uh, fire temples in India. 
Um, as the founders of those trust funds and properties would have only ever intended for Parsi Zoroastrians and not non-Parsi Zoroastrians to make use of them. Consequently, in his detailed judgments, one of the two presiding judges, Justice Dagger, himself a Parsi, took a stand and expounded that expounded who could be considered a member of the Parsi community. This judgment is monumental because never before had it been so plainly stated. He concluded that the Parsi community consisted of, one, Parsis who were descended from the original Persian immigrants and who were born of Zoroastrian parents and who professed the Zoroastrian religion. Iranians from Persia professing the Zoroastrian religion who came to India either temporarily or permanently, and three, the children of Parsi fathers by alien mothers who have been duly and properly admitted into the religion. The last definition, the third one, was a direct result of the Mazgal Navjots. The presence of documented proof that the practice had been accepted in the past provided usage practice in a country determined to hold on to and maintain past traditions. Adversely, the children of Parsi women and non-Parsi men could not be included in the definition because no one during the course of the trial could produce irrefutable evidence that the practice was ongoing or had occurred in the past and been accepted by the community. Thus, to sum up, why did the Mazgaon Navjot case cause such a stir within the Parsi community and how have they continued to impact us today? Firstly, while the practice of initiating the, initiating the illegitimate children of Parsi men and non-Parsi women into the Zoroastrian religion had been ongoing throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, it had never taken place in such a public manner. Most previous initiations would have taken place in clandestine ceremonies away from the glare of the community at large. The large group of initiates, nine of them, who had made impassioned pleas for help, directly reaching out to the Parsi public, raised awareness and the subsequent re reactions to the Navjots. Secondly, the open debate between two high priests of the community added weight to the significance of the event. The publication of booklets months and even a year after the event kept it fresh in the minds of the Parsi community. The lack of a consensus, consensus, cons, sorry, consensus on group identity caused a theological debate unlike any before and required the Parsi community to question their deep-seated beliefs and be directly faced with a situation they were unfamiliar with or try to keep out of the public domain. The Mazda Naujot showcased the discourse surrounding the sensitive subject was based on people's perceptives. perspectives. Thus, we see how all three of Daniel Hevelegger's types of conversion are applicable to the debate at hand. Thus, if a person perceives that a child of mixed Parsi, Zoroastrian, and non-Parsi, non-Zoroastrian heritage cannot be considered Parsi, then conversion by way of the Namjot ceremony is happening from outside the Parsi Zoroastrian community. Therefore, the person of mixed heritage could be perceived to convert into Zoroastrianism from a state of unbelief to a state of belief and belonging. Secondly, they could be perceived to convert from one religious affiliation to another religious affiliation by pre-associating the child with the religion of their non-Zoroastrian parent, traditionally the mother. And third, if it is perceived that the children of mixed heritage can be considered Parsis, then conversion by undergoing the Navjo ceremony is from a nominal or lesser affiliation into a greater reaffiliation or a reconversion within the religion. Today, the community continues to grapple with conversion into marriage and acceptance of children of those mixed marriages. The enactment of the Special Marriages Act in 1954 meant that a woman who married out of the religion did not have to convert to the religion of her husband and could continue practicing her own religion. This caused a breach between the laws of the land and the traditional practice of the Parsi Zoroastrian community. For many years, Parsi Zoroastrian women who have married out faced multiple restrictions. They were excluded from fire temples, banned from funerary sites and rituals, and were not allowed to initiate their children into the Zoroastrian faith. In India today, there are two cases, one in the Supreme Court and one in the Calcutta High Court, which have the potential to drastically change the landscape in which the Zoroastrian religion is practiced in India. Parsi Zoroastrian women who have married non-Parsi non-Zoroastrian men and have been denied access to fire temples and funerary sites, and having the Navjot 
ceremony of their children recognized, have taken their respective associations to court to fight for their and their children's rights to practice their faith. Once again, over a century later, it is the Indian judicial system which will define the Parsi Sarastran identity taken because the traditional patrilineal and patriarchal notions that were at play in Moscow in 1882 are still at play today. And thus, they are being challenged socially in more liberal societies and legally through the courts of India. Thank you for your time. Do you know if the uh, inductees were Adivasis, Walis, or like Totogras, like in the Vantana Church, or is that? Okay? No, it's not clear. They were living near the Moscow docks uh, within Bombay. Um, there is no mention of, of who their mothers were, you know, any caste or anything like that. Um, the focus was on the fact that their fathers were Parsi, um, and they, for all. Um, you know, for anyone to see, they were Parsis, you know, they practiced uh, rationalism in whichever way it allowed without the Nautil ceremony. They, they, they went to the Gambars, they sat separately, uh, but they attended the Gambars, they went, they, they cooked Parsi food, they did everything, uh, they drove, they, they dressed as Parsis, and so for all intents and purposes, they were Parsis. And that one thing was missing, they were just a little bit too poor to have their Nautil ceremonies. Um, and so that's why the community stepped up and, and paid for them. But there is no mention of, of exactly who their mothers were. They were just referred to as, as non zoroastrian non parsis local women. Yeah. Yes? Sorry, yes? Uh, yeah, you had mentioned that uh, you had mentioned that the Parsis who had converted to Christianity, yeah. I think, uh, faced a lot of backlash from the Parsi community. And yeah. has there been any evidence more recently of any organized efforts or threats of violence by members of the Parsi community against people converting away from Zoroastrianism to other religions? No, I don't think so. Not in any recent times. I haven't read anything. Um, there have been a few handful uh, of conversions out of Zoroastrianism by Parsis. Uh, there has been some stigma attached to it, definitely, um, but nothing on the scale. I mean, they might have personally been faced with some sort of threats or something, but I don't know. Uh, nothing has been reported on that subject. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, who's next? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks, Nazneen, for really uh, giving us this lecture and even opening up our eyes to this sort of topic of the whole controversy be behind the conversion itself. Yeah. I just have a comment to make, and this is pertaining to a family member of mine. In fact, it's um, I can go a little bit personal with this, where my uncle has married a woman from Maharashtra mm -hmm. itself, and she is a non-Parsi, and they have actually converted their son into the Parsi religion, mm -hmm. and, and that's fine and all, but the only reason why I don't see him as a Rastrian is because he does not follow the tenets of Zoroastrianism, as in he doesn't follow the aspects of Asha itself. He doesn't believe in the good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Mm -hmm. This is why I don't see him as such. Once he starts crossing that threshold, it doesn't matter what skin color, what his background is, what age, height, whatever. As long as he follows some tenets of Zoroastrianism, then I will see him as a Zoroastrian. Unfortunately, until that time, he is just going to be my cousin and nothing more than that. So uh, maybe that might give you a little bit of insight as to maybe where I can come from with that. I mean, this is obviously a very personal family matter. I'm not sure I can comment on this. Um, all I can say is uh, um, I, don't, I don't really know what to say. No, you, you don't have to comment on anything. Yeah. It's just. I understand Did your you point. Know. I mean, there are Zoroastrians. No one is denying that some Zoroastrians perhaps don't follow the path of good thoughts, good words, good deeds. There are many. Who, but there are many non Parsi, non Zoroastrians who do. And one day perhaps they want to formalize their affiliation to Zoroastrianism by undergoing an object ceremony. And I think religion is a very, religion or who you are as a person is a very personal and private matter. Um, and therefore, it is, it is up to that individual himself or herself how they want to 
lead their lives. So, in fact, on that note, there are many non Zoroastrians and non Parsis who actually follow the Zoroastrians' tenets. Exactly. And I would yes. say there would be more Zoroastrian than my cousin itself. Possibly. And I would see them Possibly. as more of a Zoroastrian. Um, I have seen this um, in, my, in my current research project. I'm interviewing the children of uh, mixed marriages with one Parsi Zoroastrian parent, one non Parsi non Zoroastrian parent. There have been cases when the children of Parsi fathers have not followed Zoroastrianism. Um, even though they have been allowed to by the community. Um, and there are cases of Parsi, the children of Parsi women who have been desperate to follow Zoroastrianism but have not been allowed to. Um, and this sort of dichotomy is strange to me. So could you see yourself as personally do that as a study further down the track of what it really means to define yourself as Zoroastrian? As in would you say there's a certain criteria? I think the person who stood here before me, you know, she said it very eloquently. Uh, I thought she said, it's up to you. It's, it's a mm. personal thing. It's yeah. how you practice good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Mm. Um, it's subjective. That's what she said. It's a subjective issue. Um, perhaps what is good for me is not good for you. Um, but as long as you're not hurting anyone. I mean, even when um, in the Persian Reviates, when conversion is spoken about, uh, the questions were asked, you know, whether conversion of a Judin, let's say, can, would, are they allowed to uh, come into the religion? Um, the answer was, well, if they're not harming a Bedin, then yes. So if they want to convert into the religion and they're not harming anyone else, um, if they're not harming anyone within this Russian religion, then yes, they should be allowed. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, Ms. Nazmin, and uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, one question I have is that, what were the, um, I wonder what the doctrines say, what, are, what were like, the motivations of some of the, um, of some Parsis to convert to Christianity during the British Raj era? Because I do know that, like, you know, Lee Kuan Yew, who's, who's, a, who's a Buddhist, he said that, um, that one of the reasons there were a lot of uh, Chinese Buddhist Singaporeans who converted to Christianity was because the education system influenced by the British education system, uh, the rationality behind it, uh, was was not necessarily like a conspiracy, but it being Western rational thought, Western thought mm -hmm. was antithetical to a lot of Buddhist thought, and so if you agree that this is true, then you would think that Christianity is superior to Buddhism. So was there that issue with like in education with like Edu like well, edu like educated Zoroastrians, did they th at that time did they think that their faith was in fear, and that's what they converted? Was there a lot of that issue, kind of like in other parts of the British Empire? How much of it was the, uh, how much? Sorry to just shorten my question. How much of that those conversions were because of, you know, attempts of the British Crown to try to uh, propagate the faith, their faith, and to weaken the other faiths. Well, I don't know about the British Crown, but I can speak for um, what happened with these two boys, uh, and I think about a few after as well. Um, they were in schools that taught Christian doctrines um, and tenets, so they were influenced by that. Also, uh, Reverend John Wilson, he was extremely um, eloquent, and um, he was extremely eloquent, and he... Um, had many discussions with Zoroastrian priests who were unfortunately not as eloquent and they, they weren't able to stand up to you know the accusations that he, that he was making about the Zoroastrian religion, calling it a dualistic religion and, and uh, you know um, putting down Zoroastrianism. Um, so there was some within the community who, who kind of had, had doubts, I suppose. Again, conversion is a very personal thing. Uh, Naroji writes in his um, in his memoirs that this was a personal choice for me. I felt connected to to Jesus and, and to the Christian religion, and so it was a very personal decision for him to convert. Uh, I'm sure there must have been some level of influence. I don't know, but of course it was a personal decision. Um, but the community came down really, really hard on Zoroastrians. They stepped up. Um, they this incident galvanized the Parsi community into building institute, educational institutions of their own. 
So later on, uh, there, you saw this, you know, children would not be sent to Christian schools, but then we would be sent to Parsi schools, um, set up by Parsi Zoroastrians within the within the community. And so that kind of was the impetus behind setting up schools um, where Christian doctrines were not taught. And um, yeah, and a lot of a lot of people stopped going to Christian schools and then instead came to Zoroastrian schools. Um, thank you for your response. Actually, it's very interesting to have the schools, uh, institutions had to modernize to to protect the faith. My second, and then the second, my final question is that were any of the issues, was there, because there's one issue that people, like if there's a mixed marriage and then people wish to uh, come back to faith of their fa fathers, it's one thing, but was there any um, issues of like, like the mother may have been um, a Parsi and the father of another religion and maybe um, especially like a religion that might not to name it but like a religion that might say that like only our way is the truth and so like if the children if the mother wishes for the child was there like okay to name it was there any issues of Parsi children who had like some Muslim man some Muslim side of the family who they not tried to come and then like there was not some tensions the, there were two or three examples given in the um, Quran Sharif versus Gigi Boy case of 1908 uh, there was, they did try to say that, you know, there were Parsi women who had married or, or had children with non-Parsi men and that their nobjots were done and that they were accepted into the religion, but the judges did not um, recognize these women as very good witnesses and uh, disregarded their testimony. So there, during the case, there, there were no definitive, there was no definitive evidence that this practice was ongoing, and if it was ongoing, that it was accepted by the community. Okay, thank, uh, thank you for answering my question. Uh, yeah, is there um, any information about what the Zoroastrian policy on conversion was during ancient Iran, and whether they did allow people to convert, uh, especially like uh, non-Iranians? Uh, I don't know. I guess that's more in my field. Of, uh, I mean, we're both at the same institution. Um, uh, historically, um, I mean, we have records of fire temples ranging from Sicily to Beijing and from the uh, Russian steppes region all the way to Saudi Arabia and possibly even Abyssinia, which is today modern Ethiopia. But... Um, uh, as to how the conversions took place or what it would look like. I mean, clearly those are outside the boundaries of the empire and they weren't just Persian traders that were uh, worshipping. A lot of these uh, ruins revealed that they were natives of the region who were worshipping um, within Zoroastrianism. So clearly conversion happened all throughout each and every single one of the big uh, major empires, but uh, we have no idea in what form they took. Uh, it definitely wasn't like door-to-door -door Jehovah's Witness knocking, but uh, clearly uh, the only way that Zoroastrianism was the world's largest, most important, most influential religion for a long period of time wasn't because they stayed to their tribe. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, but it was the first monotheistic religion. There was no religion before Zoroastrianism. So the concept of conversion, how does it arise? Uh, religion did exist before Zoroastrianism. We are just the but oldest... I actually would say it's not, um, but uh, it, it's a, a different topic. Yeah, it's a different topic. But religion That's did exist other. before um, <coughs> before Zoroastrianism. We're just the oldest continuously practiced religion in the world. Uh, thank you for your talk. That was really informative. Uh, one question about the, where does the Indian government, uh, the rules and the legality come in to freedom to practice a religion um, play into this? Uh, because it seems like the BPP, uh, the BPP can actually tell, you know, who, to pra who can practice rationalism and who cannot practice rationalism. And I think that's what the Supreme Court is taking up right now? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And do you um, have any, yeah? So traditionally, um, in India, you have 
uh, personal laws for different religions. You have the, the Muslim law, you have the Hindu law, you have the Parsi laws. And sometimes they are in contradiction to the Constitution of India, which says that everyone is equal and you know everyone has the right to practice their own religion in whichever way, shape, or form that they choose. Um, until now, it has kind of been dis disregarded in when this, I'll give you an example, when the Special Marriages Act um, in, came out in 1954, this caused a lot of problems for the Parsi community because here was this law saying that a Parsi woman, any woman, but let's just take the example of a Parsi woman, marries a non-Parsi man, she can continue practic practicing her religion, she can enter the fire temples, etc. She can be part of the community. It never been it had never at least as you know as we can as far as we can see it had never been accepted before. So the Panchayat actually got together thirteen or fifteen priests and scholars and put set them a few questions to say what is the law? How can we get around it? Do we have to um, you know, are we obliged to actually submit to this law? Do we have to follow it? And I think the majority of the priests said, no, religion is above, you know, the law of the land, and we have nothing to do with this. I think it was there was only one person who said, this is the law of the land, we have to follow it, and yes, uh, if a woman marries a man um, under the Special Marriages Act of 1954, then we will have to recognize her identity as a Pasi Zoroastrian woman and afford her all the rights that anyone else would have. Uh, out of the, I think, 15 people, only one person said that. And so the matter was kind of like brushed off and said, okay, we are in the clear. <clears throat> this kind of, this was practiced many, many years. No one, no one took the matter to court. When you're talking about the Supreme Court case, um, it is the case of a woman who has married, um, a Pasi woman who has married a non Pasi man under the Special Marriages Act. She used to go to the fire temple, everything was fine, until a new trustee came on board who then banned her and other women like her who have married out from entering. She pleaded with them, you know, her parents are elderly, they said that she would not be able to attend the funeral of her parents should they pass, and um, this got her very worried. She then, um, you know, filed a case in the, in the Supreme in the High Court of Gujarat. After three years, the High Court of Gujarat actually said that the Special Marriages Act means that if you are a woman who has married a man who is not of your religion, then you merge into his religion. This caused a huge uproar within India, because it goes against everything that the Special Marriage, Marriages Act represents. Um, and so the matter was quickly taken up into the Supreme Court in 2017. Um, there was interim relief given to this woman to say that, yes, okay, you and your sister, who's also married out, if your parents pass away, but this was many, many years later, you know, um, interim relief should have been given very quickly, but that is just how the Indian judicial system works. It takes forever. Um, if your parents, we will, we will, you know, decide on the case. But if your parents were to pass away, you have the right to attend their funeral. Um, but that was only for two people. Um, in interviews, this woman has said that she's not fighting for just for herself. She's fighting for all women within India who have married under the Special Marriages Act because. Um, what the High Court of Gujarat said goes absolutely against what the Special Marriages Act is all about. Um, so now we have, as you say, this fight um, between personal law and the right for a religion to practice its laws in the way that it sees fit. And on the other hand, you have um, the law of the land, um, which gives everyone the right to practice the religion as they see fit. So it's very interesting what's going to happen, um, but the way that the Supreme Court of India is leaning at the moment, it seems like you know she will be given um, the rights to practice her religion. So I'm not I'm not sure, but 
Fingers crossed. Yes. Is there any? Uh, you said that there were nine people whose nodules were done. Mm -hmm. um, is there any known record or something that any of these were there any attempts by uh, kids whose mothers were uh, Parsi, but also wanted to get the nodule done at that time? No, there are no records. There are no records of this happening for the children of Parsi women, and that's why that in, that definition was not included by Justice Dover. He only included the, the bit about the Parsi fathers also being Parsi because this had been happening for 200 years. You cannot ignore a precedent that had been occurring for 200 years. So he, it, it had to be included. Uh, but unfortunately what happened was that it set in stone. It didn't, in, it didn't allow for an expansion of the definition of identity. It set it very rigidly. And, and attempts, two, maybe one or two times, have been made by the high priests of India to say uh, that, uh, no, we don't like this definition, we're going to go back to the way that things were, only the children of Parsi fathers and Parsi mothers can be included in the definition of who is a Parsi and can access um, the rights and benefits afforded to Parsi Zoroastrians. And again, there was a huge uproar within the community to say that you don't have the authority to change this, this has been set in the... In the in the courts, and uh, the community wanted this to continue. They did not want to go back to the way that things were. Um, you know, they have, that's how it has been. But no, unfortunately, there are there is. I mean, now yes, there is. Parsi Parsi women who have married out are having the nuptial ceremonies performed for their children. Gender, generally here, what I've seen is that they are accepted by the community. Uh, there is a wider difference within the community here and in India. So I've just been doing my research for the, for the project and it is stark. The children of Pasi fathers in India are readily accepted and are very comfortable in their identity, whereas the children of Pasi women are definitely not accepted. Definitely not accepted, and this is why this case, these cases, have come to court because the community has not evolved the way that it has over here. Yes. How much do you think the um, the uh, discretion in favor of the fathers, Sebastian, the mother is not? the readily accepted child today, but if the switch genders, the mother is the but the father's not, um, that in, that indifference and that, at best indifference and just not really allowing, how much is that because of, backed by like religious reasons and how much of that is more just, uh, sorry, to be frank, like like more like traditional, one could say, sexist attitudes, because it could be seen as a double standard in terms yes, of the I, father and the mother. I don't want to be a harsh, but... No, uh, it's fine. Um, <laughs> it is, it is completely a social construct. Um, nothing in the religion says that, you know, children of Pasi fathers are allowed to be Zoroastrian, whereas the children of Pasi mothers are not. Traditionally, yes, the community has been patrilineal, uh, but then society was patriarchal at the time, you know, we have kind of evolved from that. Patriarchy and patrilineality is also a social construct. Uh, women today are <coughs> empowered, they're emancipated, they make their own money, they're independent. Um, we don't need to rely on our fathers or our husbands to support us, and therefore we have our own identities. And so if we as women, Pasi Zarashi women, do marry out and still choose to practice the religion, one, we should be able to do that, and two, we should be able to bring into the religion our children. Um, there's nothing physical, I mean, there's nothing religious about this. It's just a social construct. And it, I mean, over a period of time, mindsets will change. I think I've seen it already so much. And um, eventually things will uh, be accepted. I mean, that is the direction in which we are going. Uh, intermarriage is on the rise. The children of mixed marriage are the gr fastest growing demographic within the Zoroastrian community, but also within the wider communities, children of mixed marriages. 
So, yeah, th this is the way the world is evolving. I'm sorry, does anyone else want to? Oh, well, uh, regarding the point about um, whether or not the religion has any stipulation about like whether one gender should be preferred for mixed marriages, considering that there are other ways in the religion where things are inherited through the father, like the priestly status and the asta Baden descriptor, would that be evidence that the religion does have a preference for whether one can inherit a certain status from one parent versus the other? Um, to a certain extent, yes. We were just talking about this earlier. I think that'll be the last threshold. That'll be the last stronghold to fall. Um, again, I see it um, as a social construct. Um, I think there is evidence, please correct me if I'm wrong, to say that there were female priests in the past in Iran, were they? No? Um, we, we don't really know. We don't know. <laughs> uh, we know that women held various other religious positions and mm -hmm. conducted rituals that only women could conduct. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as to women mobeds, uh, it's unlikely it existed even in Achaemenid times. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but it's, I still see it as a social contract. I mean, Marsha was here, up here earlier, and she's a fantastic proponent for the religion, so it will of eventually change, I think. History isn't a deciding factor on what... No, exactly, it shouldn't be. No, just because it didn't happen in the past doesn't mean that it can't happen in the future. Hi, I had a question. So, um, has there been any discussion on, for children of interfaith marriages, if, say, um, both parents are, like, open-minded and they both want, say, like, Christian and Zoroastrian, like, uh, the Zoroastrian parent wants their kids to have their no joke, but is also open to like having their kids baptized if that's something that the Christian um, parent wants. Like, has there been any discussion in allowing that child to then figure out which identity they support more? And just how do they maintain that balance in their religious identities? So I have spoken to a few people who have been brought up equally within the two religions. So they will do both. Um, that's I'm not I'm I can't judge on that. So that is just how they have reached their religious identity. They were brought up in two faiths. Um, they you know they perform rituals of both faiths. They are very involved in both sides of their family. The family is very connected and uh, they have a very strong identity. They are practicing religion in a very powerful way, and they are very confident and happy in their identity. So um, I know many Zoroastrians who go to, fire, uh, to, to temples, to mosques, to churches in India. Um, they practice other religions continuously, continuously. It's it's not just once in a while, it's on a daily basis. Um, I don't think, you know, and I don't think anyone would say that they are no longer Zoroastrian, or they cannot continue to practice Zoroastrianism just because they are going to a novena or a, or a arti or something. So, yeah. It's, again, who, how they identify. <coughs> It's how a person comes to their religious identity on their own that should be respected. Are we done? Yeah. Oh. traditional patrilineal and patriarchal notions that were at play in Moscow in 1882 are still at play today, and thus they are being challenged socially in more liberal societies 
and legally through the courts of India. Thank you for your time. Adivasis, Walis, or like the Dugras, like in the Vantan of or is that? No, okay. it's not clear. They were living near the Moscow docks uh, within Bombay. Um, there is no mention of, of who their mothers <coughs> were, you know, any caste or anything like that. Um, the focus was on the fact that their fathers were Parsi, um, and they, for all, um, you know, for anyone to see, they were Parsis, you know, they practiced uh, rationalism in whichever way it allowed without the nocturnal ceremony. They, they, they went to the gumbars, they sat separately, uh, but they attended the gumbars, they went, they, they cooked Parsi food, they did everything, uh, they drove, they, they dressed as Parsis, and so for all intents and purposes they were Parsis. And that one thing was missing, they were just a little bit too poor to have their nocturnal ceremonies. Um, and so that's why the community stepped up and, and paid for them. But there is no mention of, of exactly who their mothers were. They were just referred to as, as non Zoroastrian, non Parsis. Local women. Yeah. Yes? Sorry, yes? Uh, yeah, you had mentioned that. Uh, you had mentioned that the Parsis who had converted to. Christianity, yeah. I think, uh, faced a lot of backlash from the Parsi community. And yeah. has there been any evidence more recently of any organized efforts or threats of violence by members of the Parsi community against people converting away from Zoroastrianism to other religions? No, I don't think so. Not in any recent times. I haven't read anything. Um, there have been a few handful uh, of conversions out of Zoroastrianism by Parsis. Uh, there has been some stigma attached to it, definitely, um, but nothing on the scale. I mean, they might have personally been faced with some sort of threats or something, but I don't know. Uh, nothing has been reported on that subject. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, who's next? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks, Nazneen, for really uh, giving us this lecture and even opening up our eyes to this sort of topic of the whole controversy be behind the conversion itself. I just have a comment to make, and this is pertaining to a family member of mine. In fact, it's um, I can go a little bit personal with this, where my uncle has married a woman from Maharashtra mm -hmm. itself, and she is a non-Parsi, and they have actually converted their son into the Parsi religion, mm -hmm. and, and that's fine and all, but the only reason why I don't see him as a Rastrian is because he does not follow the tenets of Zoroastrianism, as in he doesn't follow the aspects of Asha itself. He doesn't believe in the good thoughts, good words, good deeds. Mm -hmm. This is why I don't see him as such. Once he starts crossing that threshold, it doesn't matter what skin color, what his background is, what age, height, whatever. As long as he follows some tenets of Zoroastrianism, then I will see him as a Zoroastrian. Unfortunately, until that time, he is just going to be my cousin and nothing more than that. So uh, maybe that might give you a little bit of insight as to maybe where I can come from with that. I mean, this is obviously a very personal family matter. I'm not sure I can comment on this. Um, all I can say is, uh, um, yeah, I, don't, I don't really know what to say. No, you, you don't have to comment on anything. Yeah. It's just. I understand your point. I mean, there are Zoroastrians. No one is denying that some Zoroastrians perhaps don't follow the path of good thoughts, good words, good deeds. There are many. Who, but there are many non-Pasi, non-Zoroastrians who do. And one day, perhaps, they want to formalize their affiliation to Zoroastrianism by undergoing an object ceremony. And I think religion is a very, religion or who you are as a person is a very personal and private matter. Um, and therefore, it is, it is up to that individual himself or herself, how they want to lead their lives. So, In fact, on that note, there are many non-Zoroastrians and non-Parsis who actually follow the Zoroastrians' tenets. Exactly. And I would yes. say they would be more Zoroastrian than my cousin itself. Possibly. And I would see them Possibly. as more of a Zoroastrian. Um, I have seen this uh, in, my, in my current research project. I'm interviewing the children of uh, mixed marriages with one Parsi Zoroastrian parent, one non-Parsi non-Zoroastrian parent. There have been cases 
when the children of Pasi fathers have not followed Zoroastrianism, um, even though they have been allowed to by the community. Um, and there are cases of Parsi, the children of Parsi women who have been desperate to follow Zoroastrianism but have not been allowed to. Um, and this sort of dichotomy is strange to me. So could you see yourself as personally do that as a study further down the track of what it really means to define yourself as Zoroastrian? As in, would you say there's a certain criteria? I think the person who stood here before me, you know, she said it very eloquently. Uh, I she said, it's up to you. It's, it's a mm. personal thing. It's yeah. how you practice with thoughts, with words, with deeds. Mm. Um, it's subjective. That's what she said. It's a subjective issue. Um, perhaps what is good for me is not good for you. Um, but as long as you're not hurting anyone. I mean, even when um, in the Persian Reviates, when conversion is spoken about, uh, the questions were asked, you know, whether conversion of a Judin, let's say, can, would, are they allowed to uh, come into the religion? Um, the answer was, well, if they're not harming a Baidin, then yes. So if they want to convert into the religion and they're not harming anyone else, um, if they're not harming anyone within this Russian religion, then yes, they should be allowed. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, Ms. Nazmin, and uh, thank you for your wonderful talk. You. Uh, one question I have is that, what were the, um, I wonder what the documents say, what, are, what were like, the motivations of some of the, um, of some Parsis to convert to Christianity during the British Raj era? Because I do know that, like, you know, Lee Kuan Yew, who's, who's, a, who's a Buddhist, he said that, um, that one of the reasons there were a lot of uh, Chinese Buddhist Singaporeans who converted to Christianity was because the education system influenced by the British education system, uh, the rationality behind it, uh, was was not necessarily like a conspiracy, but it being Western rational, but Western thought mm -hmm. was antithetical to a lot of Buddhist thought, and so if you believe that this is true, then you would think that Christianity is superior to Buddhism. So was there that issue with, like, in education with, like, Edu like well, edu like educated Zoroastrians, did they th at that time did they think that their faith was in fear, and that's what they converted? Was there a lot of that issue, kind of like in other parts of the British Empire? How much of it was the, uh, how much? Sorry, to, to shorten my question, how much of that those conversions were because of, you know, attempts of the British Crown to try to uh, propagate the faith, their faith, and to weaken the other faiths. Well, I don't know about the British Crown, but I can speak for um, what happened with these two boys, uh, and I think about a few after as well. Um, they were in schools that taught Christian doctrines um, and tenets, so they were influenced by that. Also, uh, Reverend John Wilson, he was extremely um, eloquent, and um, he was extremely eloquent, and he... Um, had many discussions with Zoroastrian priests who were unfortunately not as eloquent and they, they weren't able to stand up to you know, the accusations that he, that he was making about the Zoroastrian religion, calling it a dualistic religion and uh, you know, um, putting down Zoroastrianism. Um, so there was some within the community who, who kind of had, had doubts, I suppose. Again, conversion is a very personal thing. Uh, Naroji writes in his um, in his memoirs that this was a personal choice for me. I felt connected to to Jesus and, and to the Christian religion, and so it was a very personal decision for him to convert. Uh, I'm sure there must have been some level of influence. I don't know, but of course it was a personal decision. Um, but the community came down really, really hard on Zoroastrians. They stepped up. Um, they this incident galvanized the Parsi community into building institute, educational institutions of their own. So later on, uh, they, you saw this, m you know, p children would not be sent to Christian schools, but then we would be sent to Parsi schools, um, set up by Parsi Zoroastrians within the, within the community. And so that kind of was the impetus behind setting up schools um, where Christian doctrines were not taught and um, yeah, and a lot of a lot of people stopped going to Christian schools and then instead came to Zoroastrian schools. 
Um, thank you for your response. Actually, it's very interesting to how the schools, uh, institutions had to modernize to to protect the faith. My second, uh, the second, my final question is that were any of the issues, were there, because there's one issue that people, like if there's a mixed marriage and people wish to uh, come back to faith with their fa fathers, it's one thing, but was there any um, issues of like, like the mother may have been um, the Parsi and the father of another religion and maybe um, especially like a religion that might not to name it but like a religion that might say that like only our way is the truth and so like if the children if the mother wishes for the child was there like okay to name it was there any issues of Parsi children who had like some Muslim man, some Muslim side of the family who they not try to come and like not, there was some tensions the, there were two or three examples given in the uh, Pitted vs. Gigi Boy case of 1908, uh, there was, they did try to say that, you know, there were Parsi women who had married uh, or had children with non-Parsi men and that their nabjots were done and that they were accepted into the religion, but the judges did not um, recognize these women as very good witnesses and uh, disregarded their testimony. So there, during the case, there, there were no definitive. There was no definitive evidence that this practice was ongoing, and if it was ongoing, that it was accepted by the community. Okay. Thank. Uh, thank you for answering my question. Uh, yeah. Is there um, any information about what the Zoroastrian policy on conversion was during ancient Iran, and whether they did allow people to convert, uh, especially like uh, non-Iranians. Um, Pablo, do you want to take this one? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess that's more my field. Of, uh, I mean, we're both at the same institution. Yeah. Um, uh, historically, um, I mean, we have records of fire temples ranging from Sicily to Beijing and from the... Uh, Russian steppes region all the way to Saudi Arabia and possibly even Abyssinia, which is today modern Ethiopia. But um, a as to how the convergence took place or what it would look like, I mean, clearly those are outside the boundaries of the empire and they weren't just Persian traders that were uh, worshipping. A lot of these uh, ruins revealed that they were natives of the region who were worshipping um, within Zoroastrianism. So clearly conversion happened all throughout each and every single one of the big uh, major empires, but uh, we have no idea in what form they took. Uh, it definitely wasn't like door-to-door -door Jehovah's Witness knocking, but uh, clearly uh, the only way that Zoroastrianism was the world's largest, most important, most influential religion for a long period of time wasn't because they stayed to their tribe. It's, uh, yeah, but it was the first monotheistic religion before Zoroastrianism, the concept of conversion, how does it arise? Uh, religion did exist before Zoroastrianism. We are just the it's oldest... Not the first monotheistic religion. I, I actually would say it's not. Um, but uh, it, it's That's a... a different topic. Also. Yeah, it's a different topic. But religion That's did exist other. before um, <coughs> before Zoroastrianism. We're just the oldest continuously practiced religion in the world. So, um, thank you for your talk. That was really informative. Uh, one question about the, where does the Indian government, um, the, the rules and the legality come in, the freedom to practice a religion, um, play into this? Uh, because it seems like the BPP, uh, the BPP can actually tell, you know, who, to pra who can practice rationalism and who cannot practice rationalism. And I think that's what the Supreme Court is taking up right now? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And do you um, have any yeah, comments? So traditionally, um, in India, you have uh, personal laws for different religions. You have the, the Muslim law, you have the Hindu law, you have the Parsi laws. And sometimes they are in contradiction to the constitution of India, which says that everyone is equal and you know everyone has the right to practice their own religion in whichever way, shape, or form that they choose. Um, until now, it has kind of been dis disregarded in when this, I'll give you an example, when 
the Special Marriages Act um, in, came out in 1954. This caused a lot of problems for the Parsi community because here was this law saying that a Parsi woman, any woman, but let's just take the example of a Parsi woman, marries a non-Parsi man, she can continue practice, practicing her religion, she can enter the fire temples, etc. She can be part of the community. It never been happy. It had never, at least as you know, as we can, as far as we can see, it had never been accepted before. So the panchayat actually got together 13 or 15 priests and scholars and put set them a few questions to say, what is the law? How can we get around it? Do we have to? Um, you know, are we obliged to actually submit to this law? Do we have to follow it? And I think the majority of the priests said, no, religion is above, you know, the law of the land, and we have nothing to do with this. I think it was, there was only one person who said, this is the law of the land, we have to follow it, and yes, uh, if a woman marries a man um, under the Special Marriages Act of 1954, then we would have to recognize her identity as a Pasi Zoroastrian woman and afford her all the rights that anyone else would have. Uh, out of the, I think, 15 people, only one person said that. And so the matter was kind of like brushed off and said, okay, we're in the clear. <clears throat> this kind of, this was practiced many, many years. No one, no one took the matter to court. When you're talking about the Supreme Court case, um, it is the case of a woman who has married, um, a Pasi woman who has married a non-Pasi man under the Special Marriages Act. She used to go to the fire temple, everything was fine, until a new trustee came on board who then banned her and other women like her who have married out from entering. She pleaded with them, you know, her parents are elderly, they said that she would not be able to attend the funeral of her parents should they pass, and um, this got her very worried. She then, um, you know, filed a case in the, in the Supreme in the High Court of Gujarat. After three years, the High Court of Gujarat actually said that the Special Marriages Act means that if you are a woman who has married a man who is not of your religion, then you merge into his religion. This caused a huge uproar within India, because it goes against everything that the Special Marriage, Marriages Act represents. Um, and so the matter was quickly taken up into the Supreme Court in 2017. Um, there was interim relief given to this woman to say that, yes, okay, you and your sister, who's also married out, if your parents pass away, but this was many, many years later, you know, um, interim relief should have been given very quickly, but that is just how the Indian judicial system works. It takes forever. Um, if your parents, we will, we will, you know, decide on the case. But if your parents were to pass away, you have the right to attend their funeral. Um, but that was only for two people. Um, in interviews, this woman has said that she's not fighting for just for herself. She's fighting for all women within India who have married under the Special Marriages Act because. Um, what the High Court of Gujarat said goes absolutely against what the Special Marriages Act is all about. Um, so now we have, as you say, this fight um, between personal law and the right for a religion to practice its laws in the way that it sees fit. And on the other hand, you have um, the law of the land, um, which gives everyone the right to practice the religion as they see fit. So it's very interesting what's going to happen, um, but the way that the Supreme Court of India is leaning at the moment, it seems like you know, she will be given um, the rights to practice her religion. So I'm not, I'm not sure, but fingers crossed. Yes? Is there any uh, you said that there were nine people whose nodules were done. Mm -hmm. um, is there any known record or something that any of these, were there any attempts by uh, kids whose mothers were uh, Parsi but also wanted to get the nodules done at that time? No, there are no records. 
there are no records of this happening for the children of Posse women, and that's why that in, that definition was not included by Justice Dover. He only included the the bit about the Posse fathers also being Posse because this had been happening for two hundred years. You cannot ignore a precedent that had been occurring for two hundred years. So he. It, it had to be included, uh, but unfortunately, what happened was that it set in stone. It didn't. In, it didn't allow for an expansion of the definition of identity. It set it very rigidly, and, and attempts, two maybe one or two times, have been made by the high priests of India to say uh, that uh, no, we don't like this definition. We're going to go back to the way that things were. Only the children of Pasi fathers and Pasi mothers can be included in the definition of who is a Parsi and can access um, the rights and benefits afforded to Parsi Zoroastrians. And again, there was a huge uproar within the community to say that you don't have the authority to change this. This has been set in the, in the, in the courts. And uh, the community wanted this to continue. They did not want to go back to the way that things were. Um, you know, that's how it has been. But no, unfortunately, there are, there is, I mean, now, yes, there is. The Parsi, Parsi women who have married out are having the Naljot ceremonies performed for their children. Gender, generally here, what I've seen is that they are accepted by the community. Uh, there is a wider difference within the community here and in India. So I've just been doing my research for the, for the project and it is stark. The children of Pasi fathers in India are readily accepted and are very comfortable in their identity, whereas the children of Pasi women are definitely not accepted. Definitely not accepted. And this is why this case, these cases have come to court, because the community has not evolved the way that it has over here. Yes. How much do you think the um, the uh, discretion favor of the father is Zoroastrian, the mother is not, they'll readily accept the child today, but if the switch genders, the mother is Zoroastrian, but the father's not, um, that, in, that indifference and that at best indifference and just not really allowing, how much is that because of, backed by like, religious reasons and how much of that is more just, uh, so to be frank, like, like more like traditional, one could say, sexist attitudes, because it could be seen as a double standard in terms yes, of the I, father and the mother. Yeah. I don't want to be a harsh, but... No, uh, it's fine. Um, <laughs> it is, it is completely a social construct. Um, nothing in the religion says that, you know, children of Posse fathers are allowed to be Zoroastrian, whereas the children of Posse mothers are not. Traditionally, yes, the community has been patrilineal, uh, but then society was patriarchal at the time, you know, we have kind of evolved from that. Patriarchy and patrilineality is also a social construct. Uh, women today are <coughs> empowered, they're emancipated, they make their own money, they're independent. Um, we don't need to rely on our fathers or our husbands to support us, and therefore we have our own identities. And so if we as women, classes are actually women, do marry out and still choose to practice the religion, one, we should be able to do that, and two, we should be able to bring into the religion our children. Um, there's nothing physical, I mean, there's nothing religious about this. It's just a social construct. And it, I mean, over a period of time, mindsets will change. I think I've seen it already so much. And um, eventually things will uh, be accepted. I mean, that is the direction in which we are going. Uh, intermarriage is on the rise. The children of mixed marriage are the gr fastest growing demographic within the Zoroastrian community, but also within the wider communities, children of mixed marriages. So, yeah, th this is the way the world is evolving. I'm sorry, does anyone else want to? Oh, well, uh, regarding the point about um, whether or not the religion has any stipulation about like whether one gender should be preferred for mixed marriages, 
considering that there are other ways in the religion where things are inherited through the father, like the priestly status and the Asta Vedin descriptor, would that be evidence that the religion does have a preference for whether one can inherit a certain status from one parent versus the other? Um, to a certain extent, yes. We were just talking about this earlier. I think that'll be the last threshold. That'll be the last stronghold to fall. Um, again, I see it um, as a social construct. Um, I think there is evidence, please correct me if I'm wrong, to say that there were female priests in the past in Iran, were there? Um, we, we don't really know. We don't know. Uh, we know that women held various other religious positions and mm -hmm. conducted rituals that only women could conduct. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as to women mobeds, uh, it's unlikely it existed even in Achaemenid times. Mm -hmm. yeah. um. But I still see it as a social construct. I mean, Marshad was here, up here earlier, and she's a fantastic proponent for the religion, so it will uh, eventually change, I think. Yeah. History isn't a deciding factor on what... No, exactly, it shouldn't yeah. be. No, just because it didn't happen in the past doesn't mean that it can't happen in the future. Hi, I had a question. So, um, has there been any discussion on, for children of interfaith marriages, if say um, both parents are like open-minded and they both want say like Christian and Zoroastrian like uh, the Zoroastrian parent wants their kids have their no joke but is also open to like having their kids baptized if that's something that the Christian um, parent wants like has there been any discussion in allowing that child to then figure out which identity they support more just how do they maintain that balance in their religious identities? So I have spoken to a few people who have been brought up equally within the two religions. So they will do both. Um, that's, I'm not, I'm, I can't judge on that. So that is just how they have reached their religious identity. They were brought up in two faiths. Um, they, you know, they perform rituals of both faiths. They are very involved in both sides of their family. The family is very connected. And um, they have a very strong identity. They are practicing religion in a very powerful way. And they are very confident and happy in their identity. So um, I know many Zoroastrians who go to, fire, uh, to, to temples, to mosques, to churches in India. Um, they practice other religions continuously, continuously. It's, it's not just once in a while, it's on a daily basis. Um, I don't think, you know, and I don't think anyone would say that they are no longer Zoroastrian, or they cannot continue to practice Zoroastrianism just because they are going to a novena or a, or a arthi or something. So, yeah. It's, again, who, how they identify. <coughs> It's how a person comes to their religious identity on their own <coughs> that should be respected. Are we done? Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Oh. <laughs>